Pakistan has one of the most diverse landscapes on planet Earth. From the shores of the Arabian Sea, the terrain soars more than eight and a half kilometers to the snow-capped peak of K2. Between these stunning mountain ranges and the sea, Pakistan is bestowed with a rich biodiversity and a wide range of ecosystems. Playing host to amazing wildlife. It provides a sanctuary to endangered creatures like the Indus blind dolphin and the Himalayan brown bear. Two types of leopard also live here. One of these lives at high altitude. The snow leopard is the top predator of the icy mountain slopes. The other, the common leopard, lives in an area ranging from the central mountain ranges of the country up to the foothills of the Himalayas. This film seeks to understand the common leopard and its battle for survival. To protect the great biodiversity which exists in Pakistan, the government has created 26 national parks. From the icy central Karakoram National Park in the north, to the Hingol National Park touching the Arabian Sea in the south. These spectacular areas are protected to provide a sanctuary for the creatures that live there and to conserve the exceptional natural landscape and wildlife. The national parks are unique landscape which are set aside for the protection and conservation of scenery, plant and animal species and biological diversity in their natural state. These national parks also provide opportunities to students and scientists for research and tourists for viewing of wildlife to enjoy the beauty of these areas. Ayubia National Park is located in the lush hills of the Galiat Forest. The area is part of the Western Himalayan ecoregion, which is the watershed of the Indus River. 
Ayubia was declared a national park in 1984 and covers an area of 33 square kilometers. Rising to an average elevation of 2,300 meters, the national park is located in one of Pakistan's last stretches of moist temperate forest. The yearly monsoon rains release over 2,000 millimetres of water over these mountains. Which feed Ayubia's network of natural springs and freshwater streams. Some of the rainwater flows over the forest floor and is absorbed by the earth. The rest seeps into rock crevices, eventually forming waterfalls and streams of crystal clear water. The abundance of water ensures that a huge variety of plants flourish here. The dense foliage and undergrowth provide refuge to rare indigenous species of mammals and birds. Over 200 species of birds can be found in the park, either living here or passing through on their migratory journeys. The park's biodiversity includes at least 757 plant species. including medicinal plants that have been used by the local people as traditional remedies for countless generations. Around 19 species of reptiles live here. And over 650 species of insects. About 31 different species of mammals are resident here, including the rhesus monkey, yellow-throated marten, leopard cat, Indian porcupine, and the red fox. However, the top predator here is the common leopard and this forest is his domain. Leopards are predominantly solitary animals and have large territories which they mark out by scratching the ground, urinating and leaving a scent as well as marking trees with their claws.
A leopard's home range is very variable, depending on the type of environment and the availability of food. The main feature of the common leopard is its adaptability. The common leopard is a species particularly adaptable to any kind of habitat. Uh, it can survive easily in uh, rainforest, semi-subdesertic areas. Its distribution is the largest among the cat family. Pound for pound, leopards are one of the strongest of the big cats. A male on average weighs around 70 kilograms, while the females are typically smaller and lighter. They can run more than 60 kilometers per hour for short distances, can supposedly leap more than six meters in a single bound, and jump three meters straight up in the air. The leopard's keen senses are key to its hunting capabilities. During the day, its vision is similar to that of a human, but at night, up to seven times better. Leopards, like many other nocturnal species, have special eyes to make use of very low light conditions, which is why their eyes glow when light falls on them. The leopard's hearing is up to five times sharper than that of humans. All highly effective senses for hunting its prey. The leopard's spotted coat helps to camouflage it, while its long, strong tail helps it to balance. Despite its formidable strength, the leopard uses stealth to hunt its prey. Creeping silently through the undergrowth, it gets as close as possible to its target and then pounces on it. In typical cat fashion, the leopard kills by crushing the windpipe, suffocating its prey, and then drags it up a tree or into the undergrowth. But the once abundant prey is becoming harder and harder to find. The two um, ungulates, grey goral and musk deer, they are a very important food resource of a leopard. That were reported from this area, we don't find them anymore. While they prefer to hunt monkeys and even dogs, leopards can survive by feeding on everything from rodents to birds. By nature, the leopard is a loner, the only exception being during the mating season when it will stay close to a female. A male leopard's home range can overlap with a number of females. Leopard cubs are usually hidden in secluded dens and move regularly by the mother. They can stay with her for up to two years, after which they have to find their own territory. The forests, however, are shrinking. The leopard and other wild creatures are finding less and less space to survive. As the local population has grown and spread, the pressures on the surrounding forest and natural resources have become unsustainable. The future of the local communities is as much at risk as that of the wildlife. 
Very soon, the forest will no longer be capable of sustaining either. Man is a very recent event in evolution. Uh, it developed um, in the last 100,000 years. Uh, whereas many animals which we see around us, common leopard included, appeared uh, hundreds of thousands of years before. Because of that, uh, you would expect that uh, man um, has not caused great damage. No, man has caused a lot of damage because uh, it's probably the organism which has upset more the uh, biological balance in nature. And mainly destroying habitat and destroying the wildlife species which live in the habitat. The delicate balance of nature shifted when woodcutters began cutting down the first pine trees. What was initially a small incursion into the forest soon became an extensive and unsustainable demand on the natural resources of the area. Tree after tree has been cut down without any understanding of the consequences and the forest has started to die. In winter, the pressures on the forest are even greater. The temperature falls well below freezing and the need for firewood becomes urgent. Even critical for survival. It is estimated that every winter nearly 500 trees are felled in this area alone. The local people are vitally dependent upon the forest. Having lived this way for generations, they cannot survive without its resources. Local jungle the assault on the forest, however, has become a vicious cycle. As the available wood is cut down, so the forest moves further away. The journey to collect more wood then becomes an increasingly exhausting task. The forests are under heavy biotic pressure. This is mainly because of ever growing increase in demand for fuel wood fodder and timber. The timber mafia is a much bigger threat to the forest than the local people. With greater financial resources, they clear patches of the forest much faster and more efficiently than the local villagers could ever do. The resulting deforestation destroys wildlife habitat and also depletes the resources available for local communities. Medicinal plants and edible roots disappear along with the undergrowth. The result is a desolate and barren landscape. Pakistan is on the verge of an impending national disaster. It is experiencing one of the world's highest rate of deforestation.
The forest is the key without which neither man nor animals can survive. The areas where illegal cutting is taking place are exposed to soil erosion, landsliding and avalanches. These activities adversely affected the socio-economic condition of the people living around such wildlife potential areas and the national parks. The roots of trees hold the rocks and soil firmly together. Where there are no more trees, rainwater washes away the fertile soil. And the land becomes barren and lifeless, eroding the mountainside. The already hard-pressed local population finds it is losing farm and grazing land and cannot understand that they themselves are partly responsible for this degradation. Due to illegal cutting, the various wildlife species which also include species of global significance and rare and endangered species are under threat. There are also other problems contributing to the miseries in what was once a natural paradise. Ayubia Forest is a sanctuary, historically known for its peace and solitude, but in recent years that has been changing. The area is now bustling with large-scale development and the invasion of thousands of tourists has brought its own set of problems. The noise pollution caused by traffic reverberates through the forest where once birdsong prevailed. Where there were trees and streams, hotels and shops abound. With the flood of tourism has come a deluge of rubbish. More than 8,000 kilograms of garbage is generated every day. Most of it is non-biodegradable and with a limited system for its disposal, the environment is being choked by this tourism trash. People properly dispose of या जो इसके अंदर कंस्ट्रक्शन चल रही है फैसिलिटेट तो कर दिया जाता है एक तरफ टूरिस्ट को लेकिन इससे जो वो एरियाज थे जहां पे वाइल्ड लाइफ एग्जिस्ट करती थी इसके वजह से उन एरियाज में वाइल्ड लाइफ की बहुत कमी हो गई है The garbage also poses a danger to the wildlife of the forest animals that eat from the garbage could easily choke on a discarded plastic bag and die or injure themselves on empty tin cans Where there were once streams of crystal clear water, there are now rivers of garbage. The polluted water affects communities downstream, who are often dependent on the streams as their main water source. The ensuing waterborne diseases mean more expense on medical care an expense that the locals can hardly afford. The combination of deforestation, land degradation, tourism and pollution have brought the area to a point of crisis. For some, the leopard is perceived as the most obvious scapegoat for the wide array of problems facing the local people. 
In recent years, man and the leopard have come into conflict, as encroaching human habitation has destroyed large tracts of forest. It was not always this way. Historical records show that leopards have roamed these forests for hundreds of years. But some of the local people believe that wildlife organisations are responsible for introducing the leopard into their forests. A lot of people uh, believe that probably the wildlife department introduced them to this park, which is entirely untrue, because even if we look at the information that is available historically, there are references from uh, Mughals. Books make reference to leopards from this area. WWF Pakistan has undertaken a program of awareness among the local communities. Explaining that livestock taken illegally into the national park or the reserved forest areas to graze naturally becomes marked out as prey by the leopards. By Lugungi Juana, Noxano, Lugungi Bakino, who is marring, the Ruby and Raki, or the jungle to jungle and Malki, the Rig and Raki Mara. Those livestock are available free and they are grazing in the park, although that's legally speaking, that's also something that's not allowed. So if you have those animals freely grazing in and around the park, the leopard would definitely hunt them. A leopard seeing goats and cattle grazing will likely follow the livestock back to the villagers' homes. Even if it does not attack there and then, it will know where to find this easy meal. In a bid to keep their animals safe, locals have been advised to herd them into strong shelters before sunset. When a leopard comes looking for the livestock and humans are in close proximity, they too can fall victim. Most of the attacks, however, take place in the forest. Such attacks fuel animosity between the locals and their leopard neighbour. With the animal's natural prey becoming harder to find, it has little choice but to hunt livestock, an easily attained food source. That defence, however, wins little sympathy from those affected. During the making of this film, News arrives that a wounded female leopard has been found nearby. The distressed animal has been shot and has fallen into a stream, paralysing its hind legs. The crowd that gathers around, however, has little sympathy for the creature. They regard it as a threat. As rangers and the WWF try to rescue the animal, others simply wait for it to die. The tranquilized animal is treated by vets, but cannot survive its wounds and the trauma it has suffered. The death of a female leopard is a serious setback for the survival of the species. If we have not taken concerted efforts for the conservation and protection of common leopard, then there is a likelihood that this species may vanish from this area within next few decades.
In the hope of finding a solution to this conflict, one that protects both leopards and the local people, WWF, the KPK Wildlife Department, in collaboration with the University of Siena, have been conducting widespread research in this area. A detailed survey and study is being conducted to evaluate the risks to livestock and humans and to understand to what extent the leopard is to blame. Data is being collected from household to household, building up a detailed picture of life in the Ayubia National Park. Even if a conflict is inevitable, researchers hope that it will be minimised through an awareness programme in the local communities. What they uncovered was that the biggest threat to livestock was not the leopard, but disease. It's important for them to know that the foremost cause of the losses of uh, livestock is not because of the leopard, it's because of the diseases, and it was more than 50% loss. A vaccination programme conducted on a regular basis could save a lot of livestock, thereby benefiting the local communities. Such a practice could have almost immediate results. We didn't know that we were dead from the leopard. We just thought that we were dead from the common leopard, but today we knew that we were dead from the common leopard. We knew that they had their own different kinds of diseases, which were dead from the leopard. We knew that we were dead from the leopard. However, one must understand the habits of the leopard if a lasting solution is to be found. Radio tracking is the only way to be sure about the movements of animals. Uh, only by setting a radio tag you'll uh, uh, decide how often you want to know where the animal is, where uh, he has been, uh, and you can also predict after a while where uh, it will go. Uh, even what he's uh, preying upon. A radio collar is the solution, beaming back location signals to the research teams. The next challenge is to trap and collar one of the elusive leopards. If successful, it would be the very first common leopard ever to be radio collared in Pakistan. The research team planned to capture one by luring it into a trap built on a hillside where leopards have been spotted. The cage has to blend completely into the local habitat, or the leopard will sense that something is not right. Once built, all they need is a volunteer to check the trap is working. The trap is baited with a goat, safely protected in a separate section of the cage. The leopard will smell and see the prey and be lured into the trap. While trapping the animal for any scientific study, or transportation from one place to another place. Extreme care should be taken to avoid any injury to the animal. The traps are set, the teams are in place. Now, there is nothing left to do but wait.
Once a leopard is trapped, it is important for the team to reach it and tranquilize it as soon as possible. The team prepares the tranquilizer dart that will be used with a special compressed air gun. The dart finds its target. The team waits for the drug to take effect. Once the leopard is unconscious, its weight and size are checked to establish its approximate age. Hair and blood samples are taken and the radio collar is securely fastened around its neck. This collar will automatically detach from the animal after two years. After all the tests are done, it is carried gently to a clearing in the forest. And released back into the wild. Although weak because of the tranquilizer's effect, the leopard will soon be back on its feet and hunting again. We released the animal. It was the 1st of September. We calculated the area that it's using as part of its home range and it seems that it's, this is the area of about 40 square kilometer which constitutes its home range. Information like this will help the researchers to understand the leopards and their habits better. Where they go, their home range, and how close they come to the various villages. The data will help address the conflict issues and develop better plans to deal with the leopards. Such a practice could have almost immediate results and be of huge benefit to the local communities. Without the involvement of the local people and communities, the forest and its inhabitants have little hope of survival. Solutions must involve a sustainable source of income for the local people, so that their reliance on the forest is greatly reduced. I think it's also important that we provide a sustainable source of income for the conservation of uh, the national park, its wildlife, and for the development of the community. Programs aimed at giving the local people some vocational skills and providing job opportunities are already underway. But much more is needed. The careful and sustainable use of certain forest resources could be another source of income. As majestic as the Ayubia National Park appears from the air, there are treasures here that can only be found on the forest floor, in the undergrowth. Out of an estimated 757 plant species in the park, more than 80 have been identified for their medicinal properties. Long before the advent of antibiotics or even basic drugs, Roots, leaves and flowers have been used by local people to treat a wide variety of illnesses and injuries. Treatments for snake bites, jaundice, diabetes, stomach ulcers, even cancer treatments have an ally in nature here. If the medicinal plant species are sustainably utilised, they could potentially bring economic benefits as well. 
the annual world market value for medicines derived from plants by indigenous people is worth billions of dollars. Efforts to understand the problems created by humans and the urgent need to address these issues requires education, awareness and a collective effort. This cannot be the domain of any one segment of society, an organisation or the government. It is a serious problem that concerns us all. Forest belong to the people and the wildlife species which are found in these areas. There is hope if conservation agencies and the local communities can come together to address some of the basic issues. If you uh, conserve your forests, uh, which will be the place where wildlife, which is now extinct there because of the action of man, could be reintroduced, uh, then probably the leopard will uh, survive and uh, will not create so many problems as the, uh, they do uh, now. As the weather cools, the rains brought by the west winds eventually turn into snow. Winter paints an expanse once green, brilliant white. It brings with it blankets of snow, animal hibernations, and silent forests. The trees become bare and time stands still. Only the evergreens seem to stand up to the icy elements. In reality, winter is a reprieve for the forest, an opportunity for regeneration, for contemplation. It is also a time for us to reflect to try and understand that we are all part of this intricate cycle of nature. Humans have caused immeasurable damage to the environment in the name of necessity, development and progress. Unless this destruction is halted, there can be no future, either for man or beast. The winter siege will eventually end. The first rays of spring sunshine will awaken the forest and its creatures from the deep slumber of winter. As the snows melt, they feed the streams and rivulets, rejuvenating the forest. Slowly, Life will return, refreshed after a long winter sleep.
And with the new dawn must come a new awareness of the fragility and importance of the natural world around us. And how much we depend upon it. We must all come together to ensure its survival for ourselves and for future generations.